Let's consider a mass on a spring that's oscillating. Its distance downwards from the equilibrium point is given by the position function here. P of t equals 5 sine t times cosine of t. So that's a function of time, t, and its output is this distance, this vertical distance downward, telling us at that moment in time how far is the mass from the equilibrium point. Now what's going on in this problem is that at the beginning of time, t equals zero, the mass is suddenly thrust downward, and then it begins to sprawling back and forth like this, right? So in these three pictures, I've illustrated what that looks like. Here we have a case where the downwards position, the distance from the equilibrium is positive. What does it mean when the distance function is zero? That means you're exactly at this equilibrium point. And if the position function is negative, that means that you're above the equilibrium point. The spring is all scrunched up. Right, what do I mean by equilibrium? Well, if the mass is left alone, if we didn't push it or jostle it, if we didn't move it and force it to not be in equilibrium, then it would just stay here. It would just hang at rest. That's what the equilibrium point means. It's the point where the spring wants to be, where it stays at rest. So you can think of the word equilibrium as just meaning everything is in balance. To 지나가는 거 소품 볼 때마다 중심을 생각하고 아 이게 될까 이런 사람들이 상상할 수 없는 중심 잡기를 계속 찾아버리는 거예요. 그래서 능, 능력이라고 생각합니다. 제 이름은 락키 변입니다. 저는 아 발란싱 아티스트입니다. First question, when is the first time that the mass returns to the equilibrium point? Well, as we saw before, the equilibrium point sitting still exactly at the spot it wants to be, that's exactly saying that the distance function p of t is zero. That's what it means to be at the equilibrium point. So we should just solve this equation. What is p of t? It's 5 sine t times cosine of t. And we need to figure out when that's equal to 0. That'll tell us when we're at the equilibrium point. Well, the 5 here doesn't really matter. The point is that we're multiplying sine and cosine, and we're getting 0. That can only happen if sine of t is equal to 0, or if cosine of t is equal to 0. When is sine of t equal to zero? Remember that sine is the y-coordinate on the unit circle. So the points where the y-coordinate is zero is when you're down on the x-axis, that's at the points one and minus one. So in terms of that angle, the t values here would be zero and pi. That's uh, at the far right of the unit circle and at the far left, and of course, it'll keep on oscillating forever, so it's really just all of these t values in that pattern forever. That's where sine of t is zero. Whereas cosine of t equal to zero, that's when the point on the unit circle is on the y-axis, when the x-coordinate is zero, that'll be the top and the bottom. So those t values are pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, and so on. So these are all of the t values where we're at equilibrium. We want to know when the first time that we return to the equilibrium point is after the mass has started moving. So in other words, after t equals zero. It starts at t equals zero in equilibrium, but then it starts moving because it got nudged a bit downward. So the answer is this one. That's the smallest of these t values. So t equals pi over 2 is the first time that the mass returns to equilibrium after it starts moving. Here we are on Desmos. I've graphed the position function of the mass on the spring. And as you can see, the mass is oscillating back and forth. The position function is following this wave. Where are the equilibrium points? That's where the position is 0. That's where the graph crosses the x-axis.
So here we see exactly those values for t that we just solved for. These are exactly the points where the mass is at the equilibrium point. Two Next question. What is the velocity of the mass on the spring moving up and down at these two particular time values at pi over 4 and pi over 3? So the velocity function, velocity speed, it really means the instantaneous rate of change of position. So the velocity function, if we want to call it v of t, it's always given by the first derivative of the position function. Now remember, the position function is 5 sine t times cosine of t. That's p of t. So we need to take the derivative of this product of sine of t times cosine of t. That means we've got to use the product rule. So the constant 5, that's going to come outside. That single constant is being multiplied by everything. And then here is the product rule. We have the derivative of the first function, sine, times the second function, plus the first function, which is sine, times the derivative of the second function, derivative of cosine. So that's the product rule right there in square brackets. Okay, what's the derivative of sine? It's cosine. So this first term is cosine t times cosine t. What's the derivative of cosine? It's not sine, but minus sine. So that's the derivative of the whole function. That's the velocity function. And let's rewrite it a little bit nicer. This is 5 cosine squared t. There's a minus sign in there minus 5 sine squared t. Notice that I've uh, moved the 5 through so that it's on both the cosine squared t and the sine squared t terms. Uh, you can do it that way or you could keep the 5 factored out. It doesn't really matter. Let's use this formula that we found for the velocity function to find the velocity at the particular time value pi over 4. That would be just what you get if you plug in pi over 4 into the velocity function, which is to say, another name for it, right, is the first derivative of the position function. Okay, so we have a 5, I'm plugging in here, and then we have cosine squared of pi over 4. Uh, let's remember, when we say cosine squared, we mean take the whole value that you get for cosine and square it, right? That's important. And then we'll have the corresponding thing for sine. This might be a little bit overkill on the parentheses, but I want to make sure that my meaning is clear. Okay, what's cosine of pi over 4? It's the square root of 2 over 2. Root 2 over 2. That's the cosine of pi over 4. And sine of pi over 4 is the exact same value. Pi over 4 is that magic point where cosine and sine are equal. Okay, well, what does that mean? That means that we have the same number here. These are going to cancel, and so we get zero. The velocity at pi over 4 is zero. It's not moving. It is at a standstill in that single moment. Okay, maybe it's always at a standstill. Is this spring even moving? Is the mass moving? Let's find the velocity at pi over 3. That would be what we get when we plug in pi over 3 into the velocity, or if you like, the first derivative of position. And by the same logic, that is the cosine of pi over 3. 
the whole value of cosine pi over 3 squared minus the corresponding value for sine. Cosine of pi over 3. Let's see, pi over 3 is the one that's a little bit closer to pi over 2, 90 degrees straight up. That cosine, that's the x coordinate. That's 1 half. Cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. What's sine of pi over 3? It's the corresponding y value at that point. That's root 3 over 2. So you really ought to have the values of cosine and sine at these important angles memorized, or you should at least be able to derive them from scratch, figure out what they are. Okay, what do we get here? We have 1 half squared, that's 1 fourth. Notice that we're also going to have a 4 in the denominator coming from that 2 being squared, so I'm going to immediately write it as a fraction over 4, where the top coming from this fraction is 1 squared, that's 1, and then here we'll have the square root of 3 squared, that just gives uh, 3. So we have 5 times 1 minus 3 over 4. So that's minus 2 over 4 times 5. And we get some cancellation of the 2s. And we end up with minus 5 over 2. So we have a negative velocity. What does negative velocity mean for the spring? It just means that it's moving upward. If the velocity is less than 0, if we have negative velocity, since the positive direction is downwards, negative velocity would mean it's moving upwards. The mass is moving upwards at a rate of uh, 5 over 2 meters per second, whatever our units are that we're measuring distance and time in. Next question. What is the farthest distance that the math gets from equilibrium? In other words, if this dashed line is the equilibrium point, and we draw a little cartoon of the spring moving downwards and then coming back up as time flows to the right, we want to know what this distance is, the farthest away it gets from equilibrium. That's that max distance. OK? Well, check it out. What does that correspond to as we move through these moments in time? The velocity is positive. Why is it positive? Because we are measuring position so that downward is the positive direction. So as the mass is descending, it's moving in the positive direction. That means its velocity is positive. But here, once we've turned around and gone the other direction, the velocity is negative. That's because it's moving upwards against the positive direction. That'll give you a velocity in the other direction. So moving upwards means the velocity is less than zero. Where is it at a maximum distance? It's exactly at that moment in time where the velocity is zero. I've now added the velocity function in green to the position function in purple. Where is the velocity zero? Where does the velocity cross the x-axis, these points right here? Well, it's exactly at those points in time where the spring is at an extremal position. It's either at the bottom or the top of its range of motion whenever the velocity is zero. That's because when the velocity is zero, the spring is turning around. It's changing direction. So based on this picture, these ideas, we could say that this maximum distance that we want to find, it occurs when the velocity is zero. In other words, when it's turning around, it's stationary for a single moment at the bottom of its motion, and then it turns back around. Well, that's great because this equation is something that we can express in terms of the derivative. That's something we can actually work with. So let's write it down. We already know that the velocity function is the first derivative of position. And what did we get? What was our formula for the velocity function? It was 5 times cosine squared t minus sine squared t. That was the velocity function from before. And so we want to 
figure out when it's equal to zero. In other words, we want to solve for t in this equation. Okay, this term in square brackets has got to be zero. You can see that if you like by dividing by five. Zero divided by five is zero. So that means that we need to solve for t in this equation, where it's just cosine squared minus sine squared that's equal to zero. But then what does that mean? That just means that cosine squared is equal to sine squared. Right? We're trying to find what t values make that true. Let's actually draw the unit circle to reason this one out. Okay, there's a handy dandy unit circle. Remember, the definition of cosine and sine are that if you open up to an angle of t in radians, then cosine of t and sine of t are the x and y coordinates of that point there on the perimeter of the circle, where the circle is radius 1. Remember, we're asking, when is cosine squared equal to sine squared? Okay, well, there's actually a few different possibilities. Cosine of t could be equal to sine of t, or cosine of t could be the opposite of sine of t. We also need to take that case into account, right? Because they both square to the same thing. What are the points on the circle, first of all, where cosine of t is equal to sine of t? That would just be the points along this line where the x and y coordinates are the same. In other words, the line x equals y, or when we're thinking of it as a function, we write it as y equals x. Okay, what are the points on the unit circle where cosine, the x-coordinate, is the opposite of the y-coordinate? That would be the points on the unit circle along this line where x is equal to minus y. Right, I'm just rewriting these two equations in terms of the x and y-coordinates just to kind of reason through what it looks like. And now these angles are recognizable. These are pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. So these two values, that's on the purple line, that's at pi over 4 and at 5 pi over 4. And here, those two, two values are at 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. And then, of course, the, the mass keeps on evolving. It keeps on moving. The spring goes back and forth. So this is actually an infinite list, just 2 pi multiples of those t values. OK. But remember, we're not trying to find the time when we're at the farthest distance. We're not trying to find simply the t value when we're down here at the bottom. We want to know what that maximum distance is. We want to know that farthest distance that we get. So to find that distance, we now need to plug in. So let's plug into the distance function to find the maximum distance. Notice that I'm not plugging into the derivative. I'm plugging into the distance function. It turns out that it won't matter uh, which of these t values you use, uh, just, it'll just amount to whether we're at the top, meaning we're negative, or the bottom, meaning we're positive, of the trajectory. I'm choosing to use the one at pi, uh, pi over 4. Well, let's see, so the original function was 5 sine t cosine t, so we get 5 sine pi over 4 times cosine of pi over 4. And that's the answer, that's that maximum distance, and both of these values uh, root 2 over 2. So that's the answer as a number. Let's see, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Uh, so a 2 cancels, so we just end up with 5 over 2. That's the maximum distance in whatever units we're using. So that's the maximum distance. That's where the spring is at the bottom of its range of motion. That's the farthest away we get from equilibrium. If we had plugged in 3 pi over 4, if you think it through, you'll end up with the exact same number but with a minus sign. Then we would end up with minus 5 over 2 for this t value. Why is that? That's when we're at the top of the range of motion. The spring is all scrunched up. So we're the same distance from the equilibrium, but 
the only difference between these sets of t-values is whether you're in the positive or negative direction. So, 흔들리는 프레임 속에 오토바이를 세우기도 했고요. 이것만 몰입을 해야 되기 때문에 결과를 만들거든요. 근육, 관절, 손, 눈동자, 호흡 다 멈춰. 또 그리고 제일 마지막에는 살아요. 호흡을 안 해요. 그리고 손을 뗐을 때 얘가 서게 되죠. Question 4. When is the acceleration of the mass on the spring zero? And then a follow-up question, what does this mean? Now, of course, that's a, that's a pretty vague follow-up question, but we'll, we'll do our best to try to address what it's getting at. Okay, so first of all, what is acceleration? Remember, acceleration, it's like the accelerator in your car. That's how you change the velocity. Acceleration is the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. It's how the velocity is changing. So if we want to write acceleration as its own function, it would be given by the derivative of the velocity function, since it's the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. Or in other words, it would be the second derivative of the position function. Okay, we already have a formula for the position function for, excuse me, for the velocity function. We already have a formula for the velocity function in this case. It was, 5 times cosine squared t minus 5 times sine squared t. I'm going to write it that way this time. So to find the acceleration, we just need to take the derivative of that function. Okay. Well, we need to take the derivative of cosine squared. Well, I don't know. What is the derivative of cosine squared? Well, we can think of cosine squared as cosine times cosine, and then use the product rule. In other words, both of the functions are cosine, meaning that the product rule will tell us the derivative of the first cosine times the second cosine without taking the derivative, plus the first cosine function times the derivative of that second cosine function. So that, in square brackets, is the derivative of cosine squared t, using the product rule. We're not done yet, and then we need to subtract off the exact same thing with sine. That's the derivative of sine squared of t using the product rule. Derivative of the first function times the second, plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Okay. What do we get? Derivative of cosine is minus sine. Here we have just cosine times the derivative of cosine derivative of cosine, that's minus sine. Here's the other uh, set of derivatives. Derivative of cosine, excuse me, derivative of sine is cosine. So that's cosine t times sine of t. And then here the derivative of sine is cosine. So we have sine of t times cosine of t. Woo hoo wee. Well, what is that? It actually simplifies pretty easily Check it out, every term in the square brackets is being multiplied by 5. Here we have a minus sign on each term. But here we also have a minus sign on each term because of this minus sign out front. So we, are, we have sine of t times cosine of t four times, all with the same sign, all with a 5 out front. That means we have minus 4 times 5, which is 20, sine of t times cosine of t. That's the acceleration function. And remember, we want to know when is this zero? In other words, we need to solve the equation minus 20 sine of t times cosine of t is equal to zero. We need to solve that equation for t. And actually, we've pretty much solved this before. Do you remember when we were finding the equilibrium point, the t values, when the mass on the spring was at the equilibrium point, we saw that for sine of t times cosine of t to be zero, which this is equivalent to, that was the same thing as saying that sine of t is zero or that cosine of t is zero. And then we used our totally excellent knowledge of the unit circle 
to figure out those t values. Here they are. This is at 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. And cosine of t is 0 at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and so on. Now, these are the t values when the acceleration is 0. Notice that these are the exact same t values where the mass on the spring is at the equilibrium point. So, in other words, the acceleration is equal to zero exactly when the mass is at the equilibrium point. It's exactly when everything is in balance. It's exactly when the mass is in the middle that the acceleration is zero why is that? Well, as the mass is moving up and down, it's exactly in that middle point where the spring is in its natural state. In other words, it's not accelerating because the spring is not exerting any force on the mass. The spring is in the position it wants to be in. It's only a consequence of that mass's velocity at that moment in time that it moves against the spring and starts to compress it or expand it. It moves past the equilibrium point only because of velocity. At that moment, the acceleration is zero. Now we have the acceleration function in red, as well as the velocity function in green, and the position function in purple. It looks like a mess, but there's actually some really nice patterns in all of these graphs. First of all, notice that whenever there's a big red peak, there's a corresponding green peak a little bit later, followed by a purple peak. What does that mean? The red graph is acceleration. So this burst of acceleration, that's like pressing on the gas pedal, the accelerator pedal in your car. In the case of the spring, that's the situation where the mass is totally outstretched and the stretchiness of the string is pushing against the mass and it's accelerating it in the positive direction. Well, what does that do? All of that pushing then creates a change in velocity. It increases the velocity until the velocity maxes out at this point up here. So a change, uh, excuse me, a burst of acceleration causes a corresponding change in velocity. What does this burst in velocity give us? It gives us a corresponding change in position. The velocity is changing the position of the mass. So we can see visually that acceleration causes a change in velocity, and velocity causes a change in position here on the graph. I've removed the velocity function, so now we just have the acceleration function in red and the position function in purple. And check it out. We see exactly what we just derived. The zeros of these two functions, the place where they cross the x-axis, where they're equal to zero, it's the exact same points. That's the equilibrium point for the spring. That's where the position function is zero. When the spring is at equilibrium, it's not pushing or pulling. It's not exerting any force on the mass, and so the acceleration is zero. Now notice that the acceleration and position function, they have the same periodicity. They wiggle at the same rate, so to speak. But the acceleration function, it has a larger amplitude, and even more importantly, it goes in the opposite direction as the position function. When the position is negative, the acceleration is positive, and vice versa. What's that mean? Well, let's think about this point down here. What does that correspond to? The position function is negative, and remember, the positive direction is down. So actually, it's kind of the opposite of this graph. That point where the position function is negative is when the spring is all scrunched up. It's at the top of its trajectory. What does it mean if the spring is all scrunched up? That means it's pushing really hard. It's pushing the hardest it can. That push is acceleration. So here where the spring is in the negative direction, all scrunched up, it's pushing really hard in the opposite direction, creating all of that acceleration. And the opposite is true here. What's this position? There the position is at a maximum in the positive direction. That's where the spring is completely outstretched at the bottom of its range of motion. 
that's creating a bunch of negative acceleration down here. That's creating this shape in the acceleration graph. That's trying to accelerate in the negative direction. That's trying to move the mass back upwards. So when we're at the bottom of the range of motion, we have a bunch of negative acceleration, and that's the spring trying to release and pull itself back. It's seeking out equilibrium. This wiggling pattern of the position and accelerating, uh, the position and acceleration alternating, that's exactly the spring seeking out equilibrium. Uh, Thank you.